I'm Janine. I'm a lecturer at San Jose State University. I'm an ethnoecologist. This is Lusa. She's a minpin. We live in the Champion. I was living in Northern California. I was renting these beautiful places out in the mountains at reasonable rates. I thought, I need to switch this up. I remember this instant where I was driving behind a shuttle bus and the shuttle bus was making a left turn in front of me and I said, that bus is good looking. It's shiny, it's white, it has these huge windows all around it. If it's a bus, it must have its own air conditioning heating system. And I had a bunch of leftover pension funds, some of the tiny little ones that weren't gonna do anything because at that time the stock market wasn't doing so great. Then I found a bus for exactly what my two pension funds put together. I bought the bus and I drove to Sacramento, got a father some team to but the floor and I drove back to the place I was renting at the time. I moved everything out in one week. I basically took my studio bedroom and configured it to fit in the bus. As an ecologist, I teach environmental science. I teach climate change. I teach living responsibly, living sustainably. I believe that I can't be an honest, authentic, ethical teacher if I am not living exactly what I teach. Every year I've set a new goal for myself to live more sustainably. The next logical step was to live tiny, to live small. The thing with a lot of tiny homes is people build from new, build from scratch. I wanted to recycle. And the best way to recycle was to get a bus. This is a Champion Challenger with an E450 engine. It's a Ford engine with a shuttle bus chassis that would have fit, I think, 16 to 20 people. And now it's just me and a dog. This is a 45 watt panel connected to one battery, which is the house battery that came with the bus. It has a ton of windows, which is what I wanted in my home. I wanted a lot of light. I installed screening all on one side of the bus. All of this furniture used to be in my bedroom studio. This bed, which has been sawzalled to be half of its height, this screen allows me to keep all of my windows open and only partially curtained. I want to wake up with light and with being able to see all the trees that are around me, but I also want privacy. Much of the artwork is made by different artisans from tribes and tribal communities here in California. This is also from a pomo lady who does some amazing designs. This palm is special to me. It's Arica Katachu, which is a betel nut palm. And that's native to Southeast Asia. And a third of my life was spent in Southeast Asia, which is why I have an adopted family, the Tato, a clan of about 3,000 people. My dog Lusa has her bed right down there. And I also have a walk-in closet, which most women want. This is my privy and it can also serve as a shower. This is the mini bar. Um, it's a ladies traveling case and it has about 40 different liqueurs in it. This pantry is full of food. Most of my cooking is done on an induction cooktop, but when I don't have access to grid power, I cook on a BioLite stove that is filled with little tiny chips of redwood. I've built into my systems here, there's plan A and plan B, and sometimes there's even a plan C. So if I'm hooked into the grid, I can use my two electric lights, I can run my electric heater and my induction stovetop. If I'm off grid, then I either use my battery powered lights or I use the solar panel and I use wood fuel to cook on. I made a decision to go with absolutely no propane because in becoming carbon neutral, uh, I wanted to maximize how I could generate my own electricity through solar. I didn't want to be reliant on natural gas or on propane 
and also it's dangerous. I felt really nervous about having propane around, whether it was on the back of my bus or inside my bus. I have another pantry in the Yeti cooler. You would think that you'd want to use this for cooling, but for me it's better to store food in it because I would otherwise always have to be getting dry ice. And this keeps my food more temperature stabilized. And for those of us who rely on chocolate, in the middle of the summer, either you have your chocolate in the refrigerator or you have your chocolate in the Yeti. So I have two, one Yeti cooler here, one Yeti cooler there. And then I have a tiny little igloo fridge that is low enough wattage that it can run off the solar panel. This cloth here is handcrafted by the weavers in the Mangarai region in Indonesia where my adopted family lives. And this is the harp that I am learning to play. That little white canister, that is the amount of trash I generate in a month to two months. The blue canister is dog food and the red canister are the little redwood chips that power my BioLite camp stove. This ficus tree is 17 years old. The mint is new. Every person should have aloe, to have aloe available um, for any sort of stovetop burns or if overexposure to sun. The first thing people said to me was, where are you gonna park it? And I was this clueless save who said, oh, that'll be no problem. I know some campgrounds down along the coast where you can camp for 500 bucks a month, 600 bucks a month during the off season. Pretty much after March, April, it, it goes right back up. But then when I realized as a professor, I need to have a routine every fall semester, every spring semester in the summer session, I needed an anchor. It took me a year to find a campground consortium where I can um, stay in these campgrounds for free based on a membership for three weeks at a time. And then a girlfriend calls it renewing my visa. But if I wanna stay in the same campground, I need to go out for a week and then come back in again. So then the challenge became, okay, where do I go for that week? And because of the place where I am, there are always fairgrounds, there are state park campgrounds within say about 20 mile radius of five or six different places where I can be, or I can simply put the champion in storage and go stay with some friends. Once I got over that initial hump of where can I be geographically so that I can be geographically stable and do my professional work, everything became so much easier. Every semester, my students do group projects that make a difference in the world. And this semester, my students are helping me to become carbon neutral. We have set it up so that the students came to my tiny home, to my bus. They audited my entire life. They came up with a range of figures of how many tons of carbon I am personally contributing to the atmosphere, which is always embarrassing, but as human beings, we are going to contribute carbon. Once we crunch the numbers and figure out literally how many teak trees, how many sugar palm plants, how much bamboo, how much grass needs to be planted, I will then get on the phone with my Tato family and say, okay, here you go, and I will send the money over. I really like the idea that becoming carbon neutral, I am now absolutely practicing what I preach. If I'm gonna teach about climate change and how we humans are affecting climate change, then I sure better be carbon neutral. And I get to support my extended family in planting trees that will help build their homes, that will provide bamboo for their baskets. Because of my background of having an adopted tribe as a family in Indonesia, one of the phrases these folks have taught me is the phrase, all are relations. Initially, I thought they meant everyone we're related to as our family, or perhaps being relating to all humans. And now I understand that it means all living beings. And so that phrase, all our relations, which is something that you say as part of a ceremony or a ritual or a prayer, means that you are understanding 
that we have a relationship with all living beings on the planet, whether it is microscopic sulfur breathing bacteria at the bottom of the ocean, it is a jaguar or a coyote or the forest or the waterway or the mountainside. These are all our relations. And so that is my family. That's who I care about.